Well, welcome. Normally you might want to wait a few minutes, um, but this has been pretty full, so perhaps we should start right on time. Um, and it, it's really great to see a lot of familiar faces here, but I've got to say it's, it's uh, even more fun that I, there are a lot of people I don't recognize. And uh, I really appreciate those of you who come from off campus, perhaps in local high schools. It's really great to have you on campus, and I just want to welcome you to IOSB. Uh, my name is Henry Scott, and I'm the chairperson for the Department of Physics and Astronomy. And it's my sincere pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, who is Dr. Elon Levine, who is a professor of physics and astronomy uh, here at IOSB. Dr. Levine has been at IOSB since 2002. Um, and his educational background started with a Bachelor's of Science from Yale University, and then he went to Purdue, where he did both a Master's and a PhD. And all those degrees were in physics. Upon completing his PhD, he wanted to seek out a project that would be really fundamentally interesting. He wanted to work on something that would actually uh, dramatically change what we know about the universe. So he sought out joining a collaboration in Sudbury called the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory. And that's where he went to do a postdoctoral research experience before he came to IUSB. Now given the title of his talk and the name of the collaboration, the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory, you might be guessing that it has something to do with neutrinos. But I'll, I'll leave it to him to tell you what they actually are, what they did, and why that work was so exciting. Uh, but I would like to take a little bit of time just to kind of brag on his behalf, because the work they did as part of that collaboration is part of the work that was cited for the 2015 Nobel Prize in Physics. Now, the people who were named, one of them was Arthur McDonald, who was a spokesperson for the Snow Collaboration on which Alon worked for several years before coming here and then continued to work on that project once he was here. They had a series of papers came, that came out and they, they, they answered a really fundamental question with physics related to neutrinos. I'd also like to, uh, to note that the Snow Collaboration has just been awarded the 2015 Breakthrough Prize in Physics, which is a relatively new award that is both um, founded and funded by some internet entrepreneurs such as Mark Zuckerberg. So it just started in 2012. Uh, but the entire collaboration is named for that award. And so uh, Dr. Levine is specifically one of the laureates of the 2015 Breakthrough Prize in Physics. I continue to collaborate with Snow upon coming to IOSB, but in recent years he's moved on to other projects. But he's continued the same theme of trying to work on things that are fundamental to our understanding of the universe. So he's now working on the search for dark matter. Um, but today he's just going to talk about the snow work, so we'll have to have him come back for another seminar if you want to hear about what he is with the dark matter. He's been extremely successful. Um, he's won well over $2 million for the National Science Foundation to support the work here at IOSB, to support students and an engineer in his lab. He works with local high school teachers, um, high school students, and these sort of uh, experiences have turned to be very high impact. So he's had students go on to pursue their own PhDs, in physics, in aerospace engineering, and just today we had a student who worked in his lab for a few years come give a talk this afternoon about how he's applied uh, doing quantitative acoustics research uh, to his passion of studying guitars. And he's now right here in South Bend, made his own business, uh, his own luthery, where he makes beautiful handcrafted guitars. He still comes back to the lab where they make measurements of these guitars to refine the acoustical properties of them. So, um, and that's all right here in South Bend. So anyway, without further ado, please help me uh, give a warm welcome to Professor Levine and um, hear his presentation of the 2015 Nobel Prize in Physics. Thank you, Thank you for coming uh, Well, uh, thank you, uh, Henry, for those very kind words, and thank you, thank you everyone, for coming out uh, today. I'm going to talk to you about uh, a piece of uh, uh, physics that was in the news recently, as uh, Dr. Scott mentioned. Um, the uh, 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 observation that uh, neutrinos oscillate, I'll tell you what that means shortly, which also means that they have mass. And uh, I'll try to explain why uh, 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 this work or these findings were important enough that uh, the Nobel Committee decided to lead, uh, to uh, award the leaders of 
our experiment and our chief competitor's experiment with the Nobel Prize, uh, Dr. Takaaki Kajita and uh, Dr. Arthur McDonald. Um, I'll also try to give you... I think people may not be able to hear you. Oh, thank you. It's, it's not projecting. Okay, I'll talk a little louder. I'll pretend you're my students and I'll yell. Um, and also, like in my class, I, I tend to go a little quickly sometimes. So, uh, you know, as in my class, please stop me if I say something you don't understand. Okay? Um, so I'll try to give you a sense of how we did this work uh, and how to understand the results of the work and also a feeling of what it was like to do the work. Um, and I also hope to give you some indications that although a lot of the stuff that we present is very clear and very neatly packaged, that's not the way science happens. It oft often has lots of messy steps. So I've included a couple of things in there that give the indications of what goes into making the sausage. Okay. So, um, the birth of the, the type of physics that I like to do um, actually started with a, a, a very simple idea by a radiochemist at Brookhaven National Lab, Ray Davis. Um, and he was aided in his work by a theorist, John Bacall. Um, and they stated that the reason that they wanted to embark on this work was to, to look for neutrinos uh, to look inside of a star and to prove the hypothesis that the sun shines through the fusion of hydrogen nuclei into helium nuclei. So this sentence was the birth of an entire field of underground neutrino physics. Um, and you can see the picture of the two of them in the very early 1960s. Uh, uh, inside of the laboratory, which I'll tell you about uh, uh, shortly. But I, I, this is what I consider poetry, the, the beauty of that simple idea and the rich things that it uh, provided. So let's talk about two things. What are neutrinos and what do they have to do with stars? Neutrinos come about uh, from radioactivity. And radioactivity itself was discovered accidentally uh, by a scientist who was actually trying to show that the sun can excite uh, 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 uranium crystals. Um, and he was trying to do experiments to, pr to, to study this uh, excitation. And he accidentally uh, stored some of these crystals next to his photographic plates. and. Uh, the, the, the day that he was going to do this work, uh, it was overcast, and for some reason he decided to develop his plates anyhow. And we won't go into any details of his work, but this is a photograph of radioactivity, the first evidence for the existence of radioactivity discovered by accident, plus some sort of scientific sense that it would be good to look at this uh, uh, film that had not been exposed to the sun. Now when we talk about radioactivity, there's different kinds of radioactivity. The type of radioactivity that he discovered looks sort of like this. You have a big heavy nucleus, uh, uranium nucleus, that breaks apart spontaneously into a lighter nucleus, thorium, and an even lighter nucleus, helium. They didn't know that that was a, another nucleus at the time, they just knew it was a very energetic kind of radiation. It was the first kind. They called it alpha radiation. Now, if you look at this particle and you try to measure its energy, um, you can see what the energy looks like in this graph here. Where does it get energy from, though? This nucleus starts out as very heavy. It breaks apart into a lighter nucleus and this one, and there's a slight mass difference. If you add up the masses here and compare it to the mass here, you see that this is slightly less massive. But we, conserve, we have conservation of energy. And Einstein also told us that a very small 
amount of mass can give you a large amount of energy. And that energy gets uh, taken by this particle, it's energy of motion. So if you look at the energy of motion and make a plot, where on this axis you have increasing energy of motion of particles, and this axis you have how many particles had that energy, you find a very boring plot. All the particles have this one energy. Boring, but reassuring, because that's what the law of conservation of energy tells us it should be. When you look at another kind of radioactivity, where the nucleus breaks up into a, a lighter nucleus plus an electron, you go try to do the same type of work. Um, you expect to see this boring plot for the energy distribution. This is the second type of uh, 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 radiation discovered. They called it beta radiation. Guess what the third one was called? Um, when you go to look at that energy distribution, you don't see this boring spike. What you see is a continuum of energies. And this is actually very troubling. Because this seems to violate the law of conservation of energy. So is the law of conservation of energy wrong? <clears throat> Physicists puzzled over this for uh, 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 some time. And finally, uh, Wolfgang Pauli uh, uh, came up with what he called a very desperate attempt to save the law of conservation of energy. He posited that the two particles that we talked about coming out of the decay were not all there was. That there was a third particle, which he then called a neutron. Some other particle was given the name neutron later. Um, we now call this neutrino. Uh, plus the beta radiation, these electron. And you could understand that previous plot where the electron has a variety of energies if sometimes the electron has lots of energy and the neutrino has almost none. And sometimes this unseen neutrino has lots of energy and that's why the particle that we did see uh, has very little. Now, neutrinos were invented to save the law of conservation of energy, but they weren't observed. And the fact that they weren't observed meant that uh, uh, they had some very weird properties. So they wouldn't interact uh, uh, often at all. In fact, if you start out with a beam of these neutrinos, these particles, and you built a piece of lead that went from all the way from here to the closest star, only about half of the neutrinos, say coming from the sun, would be absorbed by that lead. That's how penetrating this radiation had to be to be consistent with the observations. Another detail is that if you look at this distribution, it's very smooth. Now, what that implies is that the neutrino has little to no mass. Uh, in fact, this curvature should drop off suddenly if, there, if the neutrino has a mass. And the fact that it didn't drop off suddenly uh, uh, led them to uh, think that the neutrino had no mass to the best of their ability to measure mass. So in other words, Pauli was very worried that he inv invented a ghost-like particle that couldn't possibly be detected, which uh, is a very terrible thing for a scientist to do. <clears throat> it took a quarter of a century, but people were finally able to, uh, to see these particles. Okay, the way that you do this, since the neutrino interacts so very rarely, is that you need a source with lots and lots of neutrinos, and you need a large number of targets for the neutrinos to hit. Um, and so uh, Cowan and Reince in 1956 built a neutrino detector uh, right next to a nuclear power plant. And the thing about these nuclear power plants is they produce prodigious amounts of neutrinos. In fact, at the location of this detector, there were 10 trillion neutrinos passing every second through an area this big. And so you have lots of neutrinos going through, and you get some of them interacting, a very small fraction to be sure. Uh, but nevertheless, it was enough to uh, for, for them to definitively observe 
the existence of neutrinos coming from this uh, reactor. Uh, and finally, in 1995, Reince, the only surviving member of the team, won the Nobel Prize for this observation. <coughs> So with the discovery of the neutrino, we had uh, another particle in our basic building block of everything that we can see around us. All the stuff that we see around us, stars, uh, planets, uh, black holes, they're all made up out of these constituents, including the neutrinos, which are listed here. Um, and this set of objects plus uh, the things which convey force between these objects are part of what's called the standard model of particle physics, which has been our best model for how things work uh, uh, um, that we, we've uh, developed to date. So as far as neutrinos go, we've discovered that there are three types. They have these names here, electron neutrino, muon neutrino, and tau neutrino. They're named. Um, uh, in reference to the type of charged particle that they tend to be created with. Um, they interact weakly. That means very rarely with, uh, with uh, ord other ordinary particles. Um, they have zero mass. And they can't change the type of particle that they are. And for 40 years, uh, this standard model was able to describe all the phenomena that were observed uh, despite the best attempts of scientists around the world to find contradictions to this model. Let me pause and see if anybody has questions because you're not pre-trained to ask questions. My students at this point of the semester interrupt me all the time. Yes? Ah, wait, yes. <laughs> Other questions? OK, what does this have to do with stars? This is something that scientists pondered for a long time. Um, how does the sun shine? And an, a very related question is, for how long has the sun shined? Uh, if you take a panel out in the space and measure uh, the amount of energy that a one square meter, that means a panel this big by this big, uh, intercepts from the sun if it's just in low Earth orbit, say, it's that far out, what you find is that you intercept enough energy to power 23 60 watt light bulbs. So what does that mean about the power of the sun? How much the sun is shining? Well, imagine taking that one panel and making enough so that you completely surround the sun. You can multiply by the number of panels needed to do that. And what you would come up with is that there is enough power intercepted by those panels, i.e. put out by the sun, to power 7 million billion billion light bulbs. It's a lot of light bulbs. So that's how much the sun is shining. So then the question is, well, where does it get all that energy from? And the problem that people had um, in trying to answer this question is that they answered it before they knew of processes which could do the job. For example, one idea is maybe the sun is a big lump of coal. Um, we know how much mass the, the sun is. Uh, and if we, if we imagine it burning at the rate that it's currently burning, there's enough coal there to last for about 10,000 years. Um, that's not long enough. We have records, geological records, that are much longer than that. It's possible to also look at the sun uh, as an object which is being heated by the fact that it might, it's contracting. Maybe gravity, all the potential energy from gravity causing the sun to shrink, slowly in terms of a human lifetime, uh, is nevertheless enough power to power the sun at the rate that we observe for about 30 million years. That's a lot longer, but it was far shorter than the geologists and biologists uh, uh, knew that the Earth had been around under roughly the same 
luminous conditions of the sun uh, to, to explain the evolution of life and uh, different uh, erosion processes that geologists had measured very carefully. They knew it had to have la uh, lasted many uh, hundreds of millions of years at least. Now when radioactivity was accidentally discovered, uh, that provided uh, a temporary uh, uh, optimism uh, because if you look at the amount of energy, there's about a million times more energy in these processes than there are in these types of processes. And that would have provided enough energy for the sun to shine for billions of years. But when astronomers trained their telescopes on the sun to study what was the makeup of the sun, they didn't find these radioactive atoms. So that couldn't be what's powering the sun either. And it finally took a combination of different developments in science to, in order to be able to finally answer this question. One of the key advances was uh, by Albert Einstein, who produced this relation, which many of you have probably seen, that, which tells you that a very small amount of mass can produce a large amount of energy. In fact, if you take one gram of mass, that's enough if you turn it into energy to power about, to fill about 60,000 tanks of gas in your car. That's about the amount of energy from just turning one gram of mass into energy. Okay, shortly after that, um, uh, Aston was studying the masses of different atoms and he observed that the helium atom, the second lightest uh, atom, was just ever so slightly less massive than four hydrogen atoms. And Eddington, essentially right away, realized that if the conditions in the sun were very hot and these hydrogens were being squeezed together to produce a helium nucleus, then uh, uh, that difference in mass would be enough to power the sun for more than 100 billion years. And the astronomers had seen nothing but hydrogen and helium in the sun. Well, there's sprinklings of other atoms, but on the percent level. Okay, any questions before I go on? So now we can codify all this, and I'm skipping the contributions of so many scientists. Uh, I'm sorry, but uh, in the standard model uh, uh, for stars, essentially. And these are the things in the standard model for stars. Stars are in a stable equilibrium. That is, that gravity that's trying to pull the star in is balanced by heat pressure out. Um, the source of heat is nuclear fusion in the core. That is, converting four hydrogen atoms into helium plus uh, the antimatter partner to the electron called the positron, plus two neutrinos, plus energy. Another part of it is that the sun started with the types of atoms that we see on the surface of the sun. That heat moves out from the core uh, by photons here and by convection, like in your oven where air actually moves, in, in this case gas moves. Um, we put in the chances of interactions between these different types uh, uh, of nuclei, called cross sections, and the age of the sun, which we get from the dating of uh, 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 meteorites, radioactive dating. And out of this standard solar model, we get different predictables, including, in particular, how powerful the sun is, how much light it's putting out, what its size should be at the current date, um, the pseudo-equivalent of earthquakes in the sun, and the neutrino flux that comes out of this reaction. That means the rate at which neutrinos should be coming out of the sun. And so we do experiments to test all of these predictables against what we actually measure. We, and we see if the, if the theory matches the measurements. So here are some examples of the types of measurements. Um, observations of uh, sound waves, essentially, that we can observe uh, on the sun uh, measure different things like the density of material, the speeds of uh, material, the, the rotation rate as a function of depth, many different things. The speed of sound at different depths. 
And you can look at how much disagreement there is between the theory and what we measure. And this is an example plot uh, by Bacall um, uh, of that amount of disagreement. So it's, in other words, the prediction by the model minus the observation of the sun divided by the observation of the sun. In other words, the predictions and the measurements agree to within a tenth of a percent. So that's great. Luminosity and size measurements for the sun also agree very well with the standard solar model. And so this quote I started with uh, by uh, Davis and Bacall that they wanted to prove the hypothesis that, uh, that the sun is uh, powered by turning hydrogen nuclei into helium nuclei uh, was uh, tested in this way. Davis put a large tank of cleaning fluid, essentially, that has lots of chlorine in it, uh, deep underground in a mine. He did that in order to have chlorine atoms serve as targets for neutrinos. The neutrinos would uh, interact with chlorine, if they're there, and convert the chlorine atoms into radioactive argon. And then if you're able to collect the radioactive argon in some way and count how many argon atoms you've made, you can measure the rate of neutrinos coming out of the sun. So he had 100,000 gallons of this cleaning fluid. Um, and uh, uh, for the calculations said that we should expect one atom of argon to be produced each day of exposure. And so every month he would take this nitrogen gas and bubble it through the tank. This is a simplified cartoon, of course. And that would strip the argon that was produced, any argon that was produced, out into containers where they could be taken away and the decay of this radioactive atom could then be observed and so we could infer how many argon atoms had been created during that month. So, whoop. There. So you spray this gas all the way through the liquid, it strips out the radon, you take it uh, to, uh, um, to Brookhaven National Lab and count uh, how many argon atoms you've extracted. And he did find argon atoms being made. Only about one every three days, though. And this is the birth of the solar neutrino problem. This was a huge triumph. They did prove, in fact, that the sun was emitting these neutrinos and thus was powered by fusion but they only found about one-third of the number expected. And they repeated these experiments over many, many years, checking all aspects of how the detector worked, if there was anything wrong with it. And also, Bacall checked and improved his calculations to find out if there was anything wrong with them. And this was found to be a very robust observation. This was the theoretical expectation, the average of these measurements with this uncertainty is shown here, about a third of the expectations, numerically way off. Is that a raised hand? No. Let's take one uh, sidestep. I said that this uh, detector was buried deep underground. Why is that? Well, that's because of the existence of cosmic rays which are very high energy particles, uh, impinge on our atmosphere all the time. They come from different processes like exploded stars and active galactic nuclei. And uh, for our purposes, uh, they're something of a nuisance because when they interact with the atmosphere, they create a shower of very high energy unstable particles that uh, are coming down through us right now all the time. Um, and if you try to do this experiment on the surface, these particles will cause the transformations into argon atoms, just like neutrinos would. In fact, it would overwhelm 
any ability to measure the very rare interactions by neutrinos. And so you have to go deep underground. Snow Lab is, for instance, a mile underground. Uh, and all of these, or almost all of these particles, get absorbed by the rock above you. So you can do these experiments. <clears throat> yes? Where is the Snow Lab? It's in northern Ontario. Uh, it's a town called Lively, near Sudbury, Ontario. I have to say, though, that Davis's experiment was in Leeds, South Dakota. But this is, the exp this is the location I worked, so I have a nice figure. But same idea. OK. So it took them 20 years, essentially, to convince the rest of the science community, one, that their calculations and experiment were robust, um, and uh, uh, also eventually, and to convince them that it was worth, that this was a big enough problem, that it was worth doing another experiment, because these experiments are very hard to do. For example, you have to do them in a deep mine. <clears throat> um, but gradually, the rest of the uh, science community uh, um, started to recognize the importance of this problem. So then the question is, how do you try to do a confirmation or rejection of the observation? Um, Neutrinos can scatter off of electrons, not just off of nuclei. And so you could have an incoming neutrino that scatters off of an electron. The neutrino goes on its merry way, and you suddenly got an energetic electron. Um, and there already was a known way to detect energetic electrons by the so-called Cherenkov effect. What's the Cherenkov effect? I'm glad you asked. There was already a large detector searching for the stability or instability of protons operating in Japan. It was an American, uh, well, Japanese-led American uh, experiment uh, in the Kamioka mine in Gifu Prefecture. And what they did was they looked for protons that were exploding apart, and the charged particles that would emerge from that decay would emit Cherenkov radiation. When a charged particle moves through a material faster than the speed of light in that material, it emits the equivalent of a shock wave, say from like a, when a jet uh, goes faster than the speed of sound and you hear a sonic boom. You get a light equivalent of that from very fast moving charged particles. Um, and you can actually see this Cherenkov radiation. It's, it's peaked in the blue of the spectrum. So you can actually see this with your eyes. In fact, this is cooling water from a nuclear reactor. And this blue light you see is from electrons that are moving through the water. So you can actually see this radiation. So this is another technique that can be used to search for uh, neutrinos. So how would it work? You have a neutrino come in, and it would either kick an electron to make it move very fast, so it would emit a cone of Cherenkov light, or you could create a muon, say in the rock wall, uh, and the muon is also charged, and it would create its own cone of Cherenkov light. So then what happens? So the, the, the neutrino comes in. This is the case of, say, an electron being kicked off of uh, either an oxygen or a hydrogen atom in the water here. Um, and a cone of light is spread out. And then if you instrument the walls with special light sensors called photomultiplier tubes, um, these tubes can uh, uh, detect when light has hit them. And you can look for patterns like this. And here you can clearly see this cone projected onto the side walls and the floor of this detector. In fact, this is the Super Kamiokanda detector, which is the first of the two experiments that I mentioned uh, doing the work that we're talking about today. So let's talk a little bit about that experiment, the, some of the details. It grew to uh, be a larger collaboration, multinational uh, collaboration, led by the uh, University of Tokyo group. Um, it was filled with 50,000 tons of ultra-pure water. You need lots of targets for these neutrinos. It had 13,000 of these photomultiplier tubes. Um, 
It was about a kilometer below the surface, actually um, in a tunnel. Um, and you can actually see for scale, a sense of scale, this is a raft, and there are three people here doing maintenance on the light sensors, the PMTs. And here is uh, an event display, what an operator would have seen uh, 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 who's running the detector. You see a, a, a bunch of photomultiplier tubes hit. Uh, the color um, has meaning about when the, when the photomultiplier was hit. And the size of the dot for each multiplier uh, indicates how much light it intercepted. And so from this information, you can reconstruct uh, the orientation of the cone, and, and you can even reconstruct what kind of particle made this type of pattern. So I, I do have yeah. a question. So the source of the neutrinos here is the sun still, even though it's yes. uh, a mile below the surface of the Earth? Yes, because yeah. nothing but neutrinos can make it through yeah. a mile of Earth. Okay. That's exactly mm -hmm. why we do it there. To, we filter out everything else except for the neutrinos who can, rem you remember, go through five light years of lead and you only lose half of them. That's a key point, good. Other questions? Yes? Who pays for all this? <laughs> you do. You do. This is taxpayer funded to a great degree. There are some people, uh, uh, some wealthy people who uh, uh, sponsor some of this research, but it's mainly governments. So, these governments, including yours. Pardon me? In Europe, on the Earth. Sir. Are those natural tunnels or are they man-made tunnels that, you, that you've dug? Both. I mean, Both. for instance, the ones, uh, the, the, there's uh, um, uh, 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 one uh, in Europe called Gran Sasso, another laboratory that does this type of work. And that's actually a tunnel. Um, uh, this is in a mine, and our experiment was in a mine. It depends what's convenient and what's uh, uh, affordable. But the best one so far is the one that I did my work in, because it's the deepest. That's, that's the reason. And there was already a mine there. And the mine, for example, uh, did private contributions to the uh, 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 excavations, which are, we're talking tens of millions of dollars of in-kind donations that they made. So it's not just you, but a lot of it is you. Yeah. Did I answer what you were asking, Alfred? Yeah? Okay. Other questions? Okay. So what are their observations? Well, one special thing about uh, using water Cherenkov detectors is electrons are very light. And so the direction that the electron moves in is essentially the same as the incoming neutrinos. And so by looking at where those cones are, you can tell what direction the neutrino came from. And a picture of uh, uh, the sun is actually painted here in neutrinos. These are from point back, these are, this is a picture reconstructed from the pointed back direction from those cones I showed you. So they got a, a photograph, a neutrino photograph of our sun. They also saw a deficit in the rate of neutrinos coming from the sun. Remember that background that made us go deep underground? It also, it turns out, provides an interesting source. Um, so if you look, th that shower of particles makes many things, including neutrinos, very high energy neutrinos. Now most of the troublesome particles in the cosmic ray shower get absorbed, but these very high energy neutrinos have no trouble going through the Earth. So in addition to solar neutrinos going through the Earth, we've got cosmic ray induced neutrinos. And Super Kamiokanda was excellent for searching for that. They had a huge target. Um, now, the so-called muon neutrinos that were created just directly above them only had to go through about 20 kilometers uh, from their creation point until they went through their detector. On the other hand, there's an equal rate of neutrinos coming from the other side of the Earth, or at least being created on the other side of the Earth. 
but they have to go through the entire Earth, i.e. 13,000 kilometers of space and matter, in order to get to the super Kamiokande detector. So what they did was they studied the high energy neutrino rate for downward going neutrinos and upward going neutrinos. And for electrons, they saw essentially the same rate. Downward and upward were the same. Um, not only that, they were able to predict the number of neutrinos. That's shown in the solid blue line here. And that agrees very well with the experimental data, which are those black points with the error bars. That's not true, however, for uh, cosmic ray uh, and muon neutrinos. The downward going muons, the theory and the data agree very closely. But for upward going muons that had to go through all this extra distance, you see there's a very strong deficit. This is another deficit. This is, so this is, in some sense, another uh, neutrino problem. But in another sense, it's even more powerful because we know that those neutrinos were there to begin with. So this is already an indication that something is happening to neutrinos. More experiments came online uh, as a result of uh, this work, including two experiments um, in uh, Europe and in the Soviet Union, um, uh, looking at neutrinos uh, interacting with gallium, a uh, kind of metal that has lots of cool properties that we should, well, we should come to my class and we'll talk about that. Um, but one of the things that uh, uh, is cool about gallium is that neutrinos can interact with the gallium uh, and convert them into radioactive germanium. And you can play a similar trick to what we talked about with the Davis experiment, that you count the number of germanium atoms that you make per month. And what's different about this experiment is that this process is sensitive to the main neutrino flux coming from the sun. So this really is an even more stringent test of how the sun works, because almost all the neutrinos that power the sun will contribute to this process. And these two experiments' results agreed with each other, and they were both off uh, by about 40%. They're both less than the theory predicts. And this uh, uh, difference, this deficit, is robust over time. OK. So how do we interpret the results thus far? We've got four different robust solar neutrino experiments, each working via a different technique. Um, and uh, uh, every other measurable, remember the speeds of sound, the size, how much light is coming out, agree with the standard solar model. And there are fewer upward uh, uh, going cosmic rays generated than neutrinos going down. So the, the question that you have to ask is, are stars not correctly described by the standard solar model? Well, then how come all these other measurements were spot on? May, is there something really weird about our sun alone? And this was something that lots of different scientists thought about and worked on for a long time. In fact, Stephen Hawking postulated that there was a black hole at the center of the sun that was swallowing the sun. And again, through that process of conversion of uh, uh, gravity to heat, you could for a while still get light out of the sun. And also, it takes hundreds of thousands to millions of years for that light to come out in any case. So we, it could be, there could be a black hole eating up our sun, and we wouldn't know it, except for the neutrino measurement. Um, or are neutrinos different than the standard, sol, uh, the standard model says they are? Could neutrinos change after they were being made in the core of the sun? This was certainly proposed early on in the game that, uh, as an explanation for the uh, 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 solar neutrino problem. Uh, and, but it took some time for this to be the favored explanation. This is the problem that the SNOW experiment was designed to solve. Um, the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory was similar to the Super Kamiokande experiment in that it's a Cherenkov water detector. But it's different in that the water we used is different. It's, it's, uh, it used heavy water. Heavy water 
uh, has, uh, in, instead of H2O, like in light water, hyd two hydrogens and one oxygen, we, ha we used D2O, deuterium, in which each hydrogen atom has an extra neutron attached to it. That makes it 10% heavier. Um, but it also does something very special. The, um, uh, the uh, uh, deuterium nucleus is the easiest nucleus to break apart. So, for example, one could have these neutrinos from the sun coming in, and the neutrino could change this neutron into a proton and an electron. That's one process that could be easily done, but it can only be done by electron neutrinos. There's another process that can happen, though, the so-called neutral current reaction. And that would be caused equally by all types of neutrinos, independent of their flavor. The neutrino comes in, just bumps the nucleus very hard, and the neutron and proton break apart. You then observe the neutron getting captured on another nucleus. And then finally, there's the reaction that's the same as the one seen by the super-K experiment. Um, we can do that as well, but we're a much smaller detector uh, because just 1,000 tons of heavy water was $330 million. Okay, but that was enough. Borrowed and then returned, so you didn't pay for that. You paid for the insurance on that. Okay, so... So what, what does this uh, uh, come down to? If the solar neutrino problem uh, is caused by um, uh, the number of new neutrinos being created in the sun being fewer than the theory says should be created, then these two reactions should both show a deficit. They should show the same rate. However, if the reason for the solar neutrino problem is that on their way from being created in the sun, they convert into one of these other two types of neutrinos, then this will be in deficit, one third, but this will have the full rate of neutrinos predicted by the standard solar model. Before we get to the results, let's just take a look uh, uh, to see the construction of the detector and also get a feeling for what it's like to go and work in the detector. So here you can see assembly, a test assembly on the surface of the light sensor holding a system. And here's the cavern being constructed and structural steel being put in. And then the walls later were coated with special uh, materials to protect them against radioactivity. Um, and you can see now the photomultiplier tube support structure being reassembled underground. Uh, you see the acrylic vessel, which was actually assembled in place. It was built uh, there, the largest structure of that type uh, at the time, at least, um, built underground uh, that will hold the thousand liters, uh, sorry, thousand tons of heavy water. And you can see some of the multiplier tubes are already being uh, put in here. And for scale, here are people. It's hard to tell, it's a fisheye lens, but you get the, the idea. Um, here is the detector uh, when it's been completed. So you can't see into the heavy water because the, all the photomultipliers are uh, taking up the space there, as they should, because we want to see that light. And then, before the last panel was put in on the bottom, a photographer photographed up through the hole, and here is where all the heavy water resides. So this is a photomultiplier tube's view of the detector. So you can see each photomultiplier tube can see the entire detector. So any light that comes out of there, uh, every phototube can see if the light is headed towards them. <clears throat> yes? How is the heavy water group? Uh, yeah, that, that was the source of a fair number of my nightmares because that was one of my responsibilities. Was I, I had to I had to prove that all of the uh, thousands of feet, as we're going to see, actually I'll, I'll point that out when we get there, of uh, 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 of water processing 
a, a, a plant underground was completely leak proof, that there was no light water left there, because if you add light water to heavy water, you've ruined it for the reactor purposes. So um, I'll tell you a, a funny story one-on-one -on -one sometime, <laughs> Evan, about that. But uh, one of the things I did was I, I was I was supervising the water coming in, and uh, the, at, at that rate, uh, every uh, 30 seconds, one annual salary was passing by for me. So, so nothing could go wrong. Okay, so this is what the uh, uh, surface uh, uh, facility looked like uh, at Snow Lab, and you know you'd get up at uh, about 4:30, drive into work, wave to the moose, um, and uh, yeah, my first winter there, the, I. I didn't know what to expect, but the weather guy cheerfully announced it was going to rise to minus 40 degrees C that day. Um, you have to be on the cage with the miners at 6 a.m., and then you go underground in about a couple of minutes, and there it's plus 40 degrees C, which is over 100 degrees um, Fahrenheit. Um, you walk a mile through the uh, uh, active nickel copper mine, and uh, you reach the outside of the, uh, of the laboratory where the, well, the first thing you have to do is wash off all the mud and blasting powder residue, et cetera, that you've uh, got on your mine boots. Um, you then shed your mine gear, because you, you can't wear any of this inside the lab. Uh, so then you've got your street clothes underneath that. You go into another room, take off your street clothes, men one way, women the other way, uh, into showers. You go in one side of the showers and exit the other side of the showers. You put on special clean room clothes. The entrance to the lab is through the lunchroom. If you want to continue, then, uh, then you go through air showers, and you're finally able to enter the lab. And the, the entrance, you can see one feature here, how clean everything is. And in fact, this is some of the uh, equipment uh, I was telling you about, Evan, um, that uh, is used for purifying and assaying uh, the, the heavy water. And again, a feature that you can see is that everything is very clean. <clears throat> Why is everything very clean? That's because cosmic rays are not the only enemy. Everything on the Earth is somewhat radioactive. Some things more, some things less. Um, uh, because that's what the Earth is made out of. So dirt has a certain amount of radioactivity. Um, and uh, so one has to be very, very careful because radioactive decay can cause events in our detector that look just like neutrinos. And so you have to choose materials very wisely and you have to develop cleaning procedures like all that equipment I showed you for processing the heavy water. In fact, this was the group that I worked in, the so-called water team. And here you see me at the start of my main responsibility, which was the cover gas system meant to protect the detector from radon in lab air. Um, so here you can see a lot of the water processing equipment. It, it's both served as a purifier, but we also had elements in here to tell how much radioactivity got by all of our purification techniques. And you can see everything has to be very, very clean. In fact, this detector was the cleanest place in the universe in terms of radioactivity, except for any aliens who may also be doing astro-particle <laughs> experiments because they have the same concerns we do. Just to give you an idea, this is that cover gas system I was telling you about that, uh, that I was working on. Um, and you know, it, it looks complicated because the system had to be open to mine air but at the same time protected from mine air. It had to be open because mine air pressure changes and you can't have a 10,000 ton space completely sealed, otherwise the first time they turn off an air handler, your detector implodes or explodes. So it had to be open, but no air could get in. So that's why it had to be this complicated. Um, looks all very uh, accomplished, et cetera. Um, but uh, as I said, lots of things go wrong. So in the process of commissioning this system, I did many dumb things or 
or I learn things. So I blew up parts of the system. So things aren't always as neat as people like to present them. Um, and you can see also, when you, when you do things, you have to really plan what you're doing. And the, there's a long process in going from deciding certain procedures that you're going to execute and being allowed to execute them because, again, we're stewards of a several hundred million dollar experiment plus several hundred million dollars worth of heavy water. And so you have to start off with written plans, then you type them, uh, make written procedures that finally get through several uh, uh, layers of engineers and scientists for approval to execute them. But you can see it starts off messy. OK, what's the upshot of this? This is a set of plots. Let me draw your attention to this. No. Um, this is a set of plots which shows the amounts of radioactivity in the detector. And there's two types of things here. There are the goals shown with, as these red lines for different radioactive nuclei. And there are the measured uh, um, uh, uh, contamination levels. And um, what you can see, I, we don't have to look at all the details of this, but what you can see is that for every type of radionucleus that we're concerned with, we met and or uh, uh, exceeded all the goals that we needed, that radioactivity is not a background in our data, not a significant background. So what did events look like in our detector? This is an example of an electron neutrino that came from the sun. It interacted, scattered an electron, created a cone of Cherenkov light. And just like with Super Kamiokanda, we have um, uh, information on timing coded in color um, and uh, uh, energy in the size of spots, although it's kind of hard to see because the spots were pretty similar. Um, but uh, something as beautiful as this only happens once an hour, roughly. That's how many neutrinos from the sun we get after all this work. And with that huge target and with that enormously prodigious sun putting out so many neutrinos. How are we doing for time? OK. I better move along. I'm not going to discuss this in any detail. I'll just tell you this is an example of many different calibration techniques. We put in lots of sources that uh, create light of well understood properties because we have to tell can our detector work the way we think it works. And the fact that the data in points agrees with the solid lines means we can. The agreement between our predictions and how our detector actually works are very good. So here are the results from the experiment. I'm not, uh, again, I won't go through all the numbers here. But this rate here is the rate of events caused only by electrons, electron neutrinos. So you see it's about 1.7 in, uh, in these units here. Whereas the rate from all types of neutrinos is three times that. In other words, although one third of the electron neutrino, uh, 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 neutrinos born in the sun make it to the Earth, two-thirds of them have become some other kind of neutrino. So this is the solution to the solar neutrino problem. And so this confirms that our models of how stars work was correct. However, the, our model of particle physics didn't allow this, and so they had to be modified. Um, so how do we interpret what happened to the solar neutrinos and what happened to those upward-going cosmic ray neutrinos seen by Super Kamiokanda. Well, uh, according to the standard model, um, uh, neutrinos were just a, a particle that were born and would remain one type. In other words, you can consider them a, the, the particle, well, quantum mechanics tells you that particles uh, also have wave like properties. And so if you've got a certain wave, it will stay that kind of wave. But what if, in fact, um, uh, the electron neutrino is actually the sum of two different waves. And this combination might look something like this, this combination of one type of neutrino and another type, type one, type two. And this is what an electron neutrino combination is like. And if the muon neutrino, another type, 
was also a combination of new, neutrino one and neutrino two, but a, a different combination shifted with respect to each other, then it would look different. Then a neutrino of electron type could change into a neutrino of muon type if the masses were different because they would be moving at different speeds and so sometimes these, when you add these two waves together at some location you get this and sometimes you get this. So maybe in a cleaner sort of picture the combination that we have born in the sun starts out with an electron neutrino combination of neutrino one and neutrino two shown in red and blue. And then you go some way out from the sun and they're in a different combination because they're traveling at different speeds. This is a muon neutrino combination. And then if you go out far enough again, it can turn back into a muon neutrino. So this is what is meant by neutrino oscillations. So neutrinos that were born in the sun as electron neutrinos, shown here in blue, two-thirds of them get converted along the way into this red combination, mu or tau neutrinos. Um, also, it turns out, the, the electron neutrinos can interact with the material here, which has lots and lots of electrons, but not muons and taus. And so electron neutrino conversion into these other types of neutrinos can happen more quickly wherever there's matter. How could we test this? Well, we could do our measurements during the day and during the night. And if that explanation is correct, then some of the two-thirds of muon and tau neutrinos that we saw here during the day should convert back into electrons. And indeed, that's what we saw. In fact, the sun is actually brighter at night than during the day in terms of neutrinos. So, what are these findings and why were they significant, putting this all together. Super Kamiokanda and Snow found evidence that neutrinos can change their characteristic. And this leads us to have to change our model of uh, uh, particles and their interactions. Snow solved the 35-year-old solar neutrino problem and confirmed the models of how stars work, because this was the basis for the model of how all stars work. Um, I hope I've been able to at least give an indication that you know, forefront uh, science is done by ordinary people um, and pursuing something very beautiful, but often it looks kind of ugly, right? Things blow up, for instance. Um, this is what led to the awarding of the Nobel Prize and the recently announced uh, uh, Breakthrough Prize for uh, fundamental physics. Um, and let me just end with uh, thanks uh, for your attention and uh, also acknowledging that a lot of the really nice looking pictures here are not mine. They're produced by my colleagues in Snow and Super Kamiokanda and some other experiments. Uh, I also want to thank the IUSB R&D committee which supported me during the summers uh, when I first got here and I was doing a lot of this work uh, writing papers uh, with Snow. Uh, uh, they helped me uh, be able to do this work during the summers and I also thank uh, my wife and daughter for putting up with my distraction while I was thinking about this stuff. <laughs> Thank you. So, if anybody has any questions. Alfred. Your future uh, research in any way, has it changed the trajectory of your research? And then also, how has this work in collaborative work that you've done with these Nobel Prizes, how has that affected you personally? Um, I, I think making the change from accelerator-based uh, particle physics uh, to uh, underground astroparticle physics was the big change. Um, uh, I made that change for a couple of reasons, both personal. I like working in smaller groups. I also like working with simpler detectors and accelerator experiments are very complicated. But also uh, answering certain kinds of questions that can't be answered uh, uh, at accelerators uh, quite yet. So 
uh, there's a lot that can still be done underground that can't be done at accelerators um, or, or may not be doable at accelerators. For instance, my current work is uh, uh, searching for the dark matter and that dark matter may be too heavy to have been produced in any of the accelerators even, even at CERN, even the highest energy ones. Um, Honestly, I mean, I mean, except for the recipients, we don't think very much about the Nobel Prize. I mean, that's not part of our everyday thinking. Uh, it's, it's a big honor, and I'm very glad that uh, Art won that, and he certainly deserved that for shepherding a bunch of physicists for 25 years to get this work done. Uh, uh, I don't know if there's any such thing as an indispensable man, but he, he comes pretty close to, to being that, at least for snow. Um, I don't know, did I answer everything you asked? Yeah. Yes? Could, uh, could dark matter have triggered the detector down underground? Is that the same type of interaction? It, it couldn't because dark matter is very heavy and slow moving in comparison. And so the amount of energy, for instance, if it bumped into an electron, the amount of energy that it would transfer would be so little that it wouldn't emit Cherenkov light. So this type of detector could not see dark matter. Yes? Are other countries working on similar research? Yes, all, all over the world. And in fact, my experiment is not just an American experiment. We uh, uh, have roughly an equivalent number of participants from Canada, but we also have collaborators from Mexico, from the Czech Republic, Spain, um, India, and that's it, yeah. And, and there are other, uh, many other dark matter search experiments and solar neutrino experiments for that matter uh, that are being done by almost every country in the world has some participants. Yes, Lyle. Yeah, two questions. I guess I'll start with the... Uh Simpler one, maybe, I don't know. How do you make the heavy water and make sure that it stays heavy, you know, all the way till it gets in the tank and stuff like that? What's, what's the practical thing? Because it's very expensive, as you said. Yes. So what goes into actually the manufacturing? You don't manufacture it. You have to purify it from ordinary water. Deuterons were created in the Big Bang, and they're radioactively stable. They're just very easy to break apart. But about one out of every 6,000 uh, uh, atoms of hydrogen is actually a deuterium isotope. So there are very expensive processes to separate based on the very slight mass difference between deuterium and hydrogen. And keeping them uh, uh, from mixing again with uh, uh, light water is just a, a matter of taking very, uh, great care. But, there, but you don't have to hold them in any special state. They're radioactively stable. Second question is, so there's a slight change to the standard model then, right? So yes. uh, what are the ramifications then? Because uh, is, is it so you can make a small change here and it doesn't upset the overall picture? Or is there some sort of more fundamental thing that it should, uh, indicates? It does not take extremely drastic changes to the standard model to incorporate some of the uh, uh, effects we've talked about. But what it indicates is that the neutrino, which is the least understood of the standard model particles, probably has some, uh, some things to say in the future based on future experiments. For instance, uh, it is possible, and this is a, a subject of uh, research being done uh, by uh, experimenters using accelerator-based neutrinos, that the reason that we are in a matter-dominated universe and don't have equal amounts of matter and antimatter uh, is because of properties of neutrinos, and be, uh, but the details of which are kind of complicated. So there are many, there are hints that uh, neutrinos do hold future uh, uh, possibilities for uh, m even more dramatically changing uh, um, our fundamental rules. But it, it has not been too difficult for theorists to incorporate the effects that we have seen. Yes? Uh, what is the uh, goal of the log-based 
baseline studies in terms of you know, expanding on the, the role of the treatments? In fact, that, that's what I was uh, re uh, referring to. Um, that one of, the, one of the basic things is the question if, uh, um, if uh, uh, all three types of neutrinos, how strongly they change one into the other, uh, whether um, uh, um, there are other experiments looking to see whether neutrinos are in fact their own antimatter from things, something called a neutrino, neutrinoless double beta decay. So there are many experiments testing different aspects of neutrinos that may hold hints to a, a, a really revolutionary change in our view of particles and how they interact. Is that it? That's a stretch. Questions? Other questions? Yes? Um, how are you able to compensate How are you able to keep the geoneutrinos from interfering with your results while you're... Well, first of all, the rate of geoneutrinos is very small in comparison with solar neutrinos. Uh, their energies are somewhat different. They're kind of like the same as reactor neutrinos because they're based on the K of uranium and thorium. Um, and so um, even the number that we could see uh, was just a small background. There may be one or two geoneutrinos in our solar neutrino sample. But there have been other neutrino experiments that have been looking for these and have seen them. <coughs> Excuse me. Yes. I'm just wondering how your scientific mind works. <laughs> you know. You're making who, an assumption. But okay. Who comes up? <laughs> no, but I mean, you said, well, deuterium breaks apart. Well, who comes up with the idea that you use this big vessel of deuterium as, a, as, suppo as opposed to some other thing? And how do people all gather around and work together to do all this stuff? Lots, when a problem becomes hard enough, lots of people sit around trying to think of how to address that problem. In the particular case that you gave, the particular example for solar neutrinos, there was one special guy, uh, Herbert Chen at UC uh, uh, Irvine, who uh, thought of the idea of using heavy water as a way for detecting solar neutrinos. Um, so you have to think about the properties of the things that you're looking at and uh, uh, think about what you know about interactions between the particles that, that you have in hand and predict what, what will work and what won't. And then you have to convince a lot of other scientists that it's interesting and then you have to convince funding agencies that you know what you're doing and that it's going to be a good use of your money. And believe me, there's far, far, far more good ideas than there are funded experiments. Um, so it's not one person, it's not all at once, it's not one genius. There, yeah, well, that's my take anyhow. Yes? So what are the other questions yet unresolved? Um, I, I've alluded to some of them, but there's so many uh, uh, unresolved ones. You know, uh, 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 I mean, uh, one question is what the, what the different masses of neutrinos are. And is it necessarily so that the neutrino masses uh, fall in line with the charged partners uh, that they are created with? Like, is, is the lightest neutrino an electron neutrino, and the second lightest uh, muon, and the third uh, uh, tau? Or is the electron neutrino, in fact, the heaviest? There, there are many, many different questions that are not resolved. Yeah. There are lots of students here, and, um, and for myself, I'm just curious um, if you could share how you have engaged them in this work, and what are you thinking you might do in the future to, to get more students excited about doing this and spending more summers with you, and the type of problems or combinations of the small problems they can help solve? The short answer is I'll have to send you one of my grant proposals where that's one of the things that I tell the National Science Foundation. My plans for um, engaging undergraduates in, uh, in basic physics research. And um, 
what I do with them involves taking some aspect of either the um, equipment that we have to develop for these experiments and work with them to, to, uh, so that they take some part of that project and execute it. For instance, I have three students working with me now. Uh, I don't know if they're here. Uh, Haley Morsodi and Alan Rader. Pardon? Oh, Aaron Rader is working with me. So Haley has been working with me for some time on developing uh, acoustic transducers that uh, uh, are useful for the dark matter search, but uh, have also, we've been requested to deliver some uh, to uh, a group at Fermilab that's uh, um, uh, uh, studying uh, muons in a, a, a muon uh, accelerator and another experiment called the G-2 experiment has requested them and so a competing dark matter experiment. So she's been working on developing acoustic transducers of different types. And, uh, Aaron has uh, uh, fabricate, designed and fabricated a system that simulates not this experiment, but uh, the experiments that I'm working on now for dark matter. And he, he simulates the very challenging conditions inside these bubble chambers that are very high temperature and go from atmospheric pressure up to 10 atmospheres in uh, 30 milliseconds. And he's uh, 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 designed and fabricated systems that simulate that so that we can tell how components uh, will survive under those challenging conditions. And so he vets different materials for the, the chemistry that they uh, uh, might uh, also suffer uh, under those conditions. So those are two examples. It's, but essentially, it's taking small parts of our contribution to the expert that can be done in a reasonable amount of time while still getting all A's, right, Aaron? All A's, um, and, and in the summers, of course, as well. Let's yes. Go ahead. Please. No, um, I've got a question. Just a question about. I can talk to Henry anytime. About the, <laughs> the helio seismology. Mm -hmm. um, how much study actually went into that, exploring the sun's interior? Oh, a, a great deal and there, by astronomers on the Earth, but also um, uh, with satellites. I, I don't know if you've ever heard of a satellite called the SOHO satellite, which uh, um, has studied uh, the sun. What they do is, is look at different things, such as um, uh, the rate at which different size patches of the sun move out or move in. And these are affected by things that are going on underneath them. So they have special detectors. I don't want to get too far into the weeds, but it, if, if you're at all familiar with this, they, they use a Doppler shift phenomena on uh, the light coming from the sun. And that can tell you about uh, how these different patches, you know, how they're moving relative to the Earth. Yes? Well, from Ontario uh, Hydro. So what use is the um, heavy water in a reactor? What, what purpose is it? It's to moderate neutrons. One of the uh, uh, things that a reactor produces is high energy neutrons, which are very dangerous and also uh, you know, make other things radioactive. Um, and and uh, um, uh, it can also cause it, well, so anyhow, so what it, the, the, the deuteron is very easy to break up by a neutron, and that eats up the energy of these high energy neutrons. That's what you're asking? Yeah. Let's thank uh, Dr. Levine again. There are some light refreshments near the front of the building, and I think. Uh, I think Elon can stick around for a little bit. In case there are any more questions, we can speak with him afterward. Yeah, don't be shy. <laughs> Thank you for coming.